Well, thanks very much, and welcome to everyone, and I appreciate the, the turnout tonight. What we're looking at here is a global view of the glaciers of northwestern North America. And, you know, those of us who live in Fairbanks and are often fortunate enough to fly down to Anchorage or Seattle might have the chance to look out the window, and on a clear day, you get a view of these massive ice fields beneath you. And if you're like me, you might be curious to know more about these glaciers. Why is there so much ice in Alaska? How many glaciers are there up here? Why is a lot of the ice focused along the coastal regions and not more in the interior where we know it's actually colder? And what might be happening to these glaciers in the future? We hear a lot about climate change. Are these glaciers going to be melting and uh, retreating in the future? And what can we expect in terms of these changes? And so today what I'd like to do is take you on a bit of a journey that goes from the top of the ice field all the way down the valley as this ice flows into the fjords and valleys of Alaska, into the rivers, the meltwater that's generated that makes its way to lakes and eventually out into the fjords and the ocean. And this fresh water has unique characteristics and what it does is it provides nutrients and affects the many ecosystems that exist in these areas of Alaska. And ultimately, this water makes its way all the way out into the ocean, where it actually impacts not only our local ecosystems, but people all around the world. Because this water is going into the ocean and causing the sea level to rise. And so people living all around are actually impacted by these changes. I'm going to start today with just a few basic facts about the glaciers of Alaska, a little bit of trivia to start us off. We have glaciers, they're shown here in blue, that span the entire mountain ranges of Alaska, all the way from the southern coastal regions in through the St. Elias Mountains, the Wrangell Mountains, into the Chugach near Anchorage, and then the interior Alaska Range, and all the way up into the Brooks Range. Now the reason so much of this ice is occurring right along the Gulf of Alaska is that a lot of our storm systems come in from the Aleutians and they take moisture from the ocean and push it up against these huge mountains that are located all along the coast. And when these storms hit the mountains, they rise up and they deposit a lot of snow. So we get enormous amounts of moisture and, and snowfall all along these areas. And then those systems cannot get inland and create as much ice and snow in the interior. Now, we've just done a really detailed mapping of all the glaciers in Alaska, and it took us about two years to do this. We used satellite data. And from this mapping, we learned that there's about 27,000 glaciers in Alaska. Now, as scientists, we like to think more about the area that's covered by these glaciers. That's more meaningful for us. And so this is about 87,000 square kilometers of ice, or about 33,600 square miles. This is about 5% of the state of Alaska. Now, to put it in terms that might be easier for us to visualize, if you took all of that ice and put it together, it would cover an area about the size of the state of Maine. So we have some of the largest amounts of ice of anywhere on the planet, other than, of course, the large ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica, which contain almost all of the fresh water on the Earth. But outside of that, Alaska is one of the largest areas of ice on the entire planet. So today we're going to take a journey from the top of the snowpack where the glaciers form as it comes down through the valleys and into the lakes and rivers and impacts ecosystems in these areas, makes its way into the estuaries and ultimately out into the ocean. And we want to learn more about how these different systems are being impacted and the people who are living in these areas, how their lives are being changed by the glaciers and the runoff that's occurring from these systems. So let's start by thinking a little bit about how a glacier changes over time. And one of the best ways that we think about this as scientists, we talk about what's called the mass balance. And that's just the overall mass of a glacier at any given time. How much snow and ice is contained in that glacier at a certain time. And almost all of the mass balance is controlled entirely by the climate. And that is to say that the amount of mass that's added or lost from the system really depends on how much snow falls on the glacier, mostly in the wintertime, and then how much of that melts away in the summer when it starts to warm up, you get warm temperatures, you have more sunshine occurring on that glacier. So as glaciologists, we really want to know more about how that mass changes over time 
how it's a change in the past, in the present, and into the future, and how that impacts the systems that are downstream of these areas that may be receiving the meltwater runoff. We're going to start our story by looking at precipitation. And it really begins here at the level of the snowflake. This is a picture of a beautiful snowflake. These snow crystals will form up at high elevations where temperatures are usually uh, below freezing. And so wherever we have cold temperatures up high in the mountains, snow is able to form. And snow will generally have these sort of dendritic crystal arms going out like this when it first forms in the atmosphere. Now we have Carl Benson in, in the audience tonight, one of our emeritus professors. And he likes to say that snow makes glaciers grow. Actually, we sing this at the Christmas party. And so this is, in fact, of course, the truth. Because as you see here, snow accumulating on the landscape, this is how a glacier grows. And in fact, it's the very definition of a glacier. It's any time that a snow is landing on the, a surface and then able to accumulate from year to year, this is really what defines a glacier. Any of you who've been out shoveling the snow this year will know that a big shovel full of snow is pretty heavy. Now imagine, we had seven meters, about 30 feet of snow, on the Valdez Glacier last year up high. Imagine that amount of snow in one year accumulating and the pressure and the forces that are pushing down on the bottom of that snow. And that's what makes those snow crystals that I showed you in the last slide break apart, form a, a crystal of ice, and this eventually becomes a glacier over time. Now, we really need to know as glaciologists what's the distribution of snow around the glaciers and, in fact, across the entire landscape. And this is how we've traditionally done it. This has been done for many, many years. Is you just go out and you get a shovel and you start digging. And here are some young uh, folks out on the Juneau ice fields. Uh, we're getting them to do our, our snow pits. Um, Here's me at the bottom of a, a about three meter or a 15 foot snow, snow pit. These take us a better part of a day or two. They tell us an enormous amount of information about what's happening right at that location. But we don't know what's happening over all those mountain ranges that I talked about. Because it's hard to extrapolate this one measurement to spread it out over a broad area. So what our group is doing in partnership with a lot of different agencies here in Alaska is we're starting to use some more modern technology. And we're using what's called a ground penetrating radar. And what you see here is a radar system being towed behind a sled. And then these fellows are taking a, a, a snow probe, an avalanche probe, to check these measurements as they go along. And so with this method, we can cover a lot of area. And what I'm going to show you here is a video of the kind of work. This is a, a sped up video, obviously. And here we are. We're looking at some of the snow cores as well as we do this radar work. And what we're doing here is we're taking cores of the snow and looking at those layers. Because the radar tells us, gives us a nice image of the layers of snow. Again, we want to have some ground data to make sure that what we're seeing in the radar is actually uh, an accurate observation. You see in that last slide, we were using a helicopter to get around. And so we have also attached this system, the same technology, to the bottom of an, a, a, a helicopter system. And it's the basic idea is that we're measuring the travel time of an electromagnetic wave. If we can precisely time it, it gets pulsed out from one side and then measured on the other side. We get the travel time of that wave, and that'll tell us the distance to the top of the snow and also to the the transition between the snow and the ice. This gives us a really nice mapping of the distribution of the snow all the way up the valley. Here's the kind of results that we get from this. This is a, a snow machine traverse up the Valdez Glacier. And the blue colors indicate lower snow packs around one to two meters of depth. And the reds and yellows are in the range of five or six meters. So you can see the variability from the low part of the glacier to the high part of the glacier, giving us a lot of measurements all the way up. Now we're looking at the same data, but kind of in a different format. And what I'm showing here is on this horizontal axis, the elevation of the glacier. And this is the low part of the glacier and the upper part of the glacier over here. And on this axis, we're looking at the depth of the snow. And so we see, like I showed in the last slide, that the snow depths get higher, it get deeper with elevation on the glacier, which is what we would expect. 
And the point of this slide is that from year to year, between 2012 in red and 2013 in blue, there's quite a bit of variability from year to year, a couple of meters difference. And so we have to be able to monitor these things on a yearly basis to understand what are the patterns from one season to the next. This is the same kind of information, the low part of the glacier up to the high part, but now we're looking at a few different glaciers around the state. And let me just show you where these glaciers live in Alaska. We start over here with this blue one, and it's somewhere around one to two meters of snow. That's the Gulcana Glacier. Probably some people in this room have, have spent some time up there. It's one of the most accessible glaciers to Fairbanks. You see, it doesn't have as nearly as much snow as some of these other glaciers that are getting closer to the coast. Here we're down at the Eklutna Glacier, and this is the red curve. The Eklutna, by the way, is a really important glacier for the folks living near Anchorage because it supplies a lot of the water for, for the town, of, for the city of Anchorage. And so knowing the snow depth is important for, for water resources there. And this blue one is the Scott Glacier, which is near Cordova. And you can see we're getting up to about five or six meters there. So you can get an idea of the variability of the snowpack, and it goes back to that idea that a lot of the weather systems come in and deposit snow near the coast, much more snow, and then drier as we go into the interior. So what have we learned about this part of the story? There's more snow near the coast, and it depends strongly on the elevation on the glacier, and it's highly variable from year to year. Now we're using this information to help us build a story about the mass balance of the glacier. So let's think a little bit more. We're going to be seeing some curves like this, so I want to introduce to you this idea of a mass balance uh, variation. And this is just sort of a, a made-up curve that just gives you the idea of how this works. And so a glacier from one year, we're looking at years on the x-axis or the horizontal axis, and then the mass of the glacier over time. And so it will gain mass in the wintertime and lose mass in the summertime from year to year. And what we've just looked at is that positive part of the curve, that increase from the end of the fall to the start of the next spring. Now, as I said earlier, the, the mass balance depends on these climate variables. So let's start looking at the other part of the story, which is the radiation and the air temperature that causes it to melt. In the summertime, the sun comes out, um, and we have more heat in the atmosphere. It starts to cause the glacier to melt and to generate water that goes down the valley. So we're moving now from the upper cold ice fields all the way down to the lower part of the glacier where it is uh, starting to melt. These are some slush ponds down in the, what we call the ablation area of the glacier. And the way that we measure this part of the mass balance is we go out with what's called a steam drill. That's that big uh, steam wand that you see there. We're up on the Denali uh, National Park in this slide. We're putting in some PVC poles that will freeze into the ice and that we will have as a marker. We come back and we can look at how much the ice is melted rel relative to that pole. That will tell us the amount of melt that occurs at that location. So what we've just measured then with that part of the observation is that negative part of the curve from when there's a lot of accumulation at the end of the winter down through the summer where it starts to become negative. So this mass balance idea is kind of like your bank account or your wallet. If you're getting more money than you're spending, you'll be, have a positive balance. If you're spending more than what you're earning, your checkbook starts to get more negative. So that's the kind of variation that we're trying to chart here with the glaciers themselves. Now, things that we've learned about mass balance come a lot from these two very special glaciers that have been measured by the U.S. Geological Survey all the way back to 1965. So they give us a very nice long-term record of these changes. Here's where they're located. Like I said, Gulcana, closer to home here. Wolverine down around the Seward area near the coast. What we're looking at here is that mass balance, but just shown in a, in a bar plot format. And the summer, that negative part of the curve is shown in orange. And the accumulation, the positive, is shown in blue. When you add those together, you get the overall mass of the glacier shown in the yellow there. So that is the annual, or sort of the net change in its mass for that particular year. Now what I want you to notice is that the Gulcana Glacier, it varies around one or two meters of gain and one or two meters of mass loss in the summer. If you come down here to the Wolverine, 
we're up around two to four meters in the accumulation and the uh, uh, melting part of the curve. This is telling us that the variability is much higher near the coast. There's a lot more snow that falls on the Wolverine in the given year, but because it's in a warmer environment, there's also a lot more melt that occurs. And this is what we call the mass balance amplitude, or sort of the, the size of that signal every year. The amount of meltwater that's generated is quite a bit more down at the coast than it is in this drier interior area. Now, another way that we can measure this is actually we're making our way now to the front of the glacier where the, the streams are coming out. All this meltwater comes often into a single stream, and we can measure what's called the discharge, or the amount of flow that's coming through this area. And that's also been done at these two glaciers for many years now. Here we're looking at the average amount of runoff or discharge through the summer seasons from June all the way through September and October. And you can see that the discharge at Gulcana is shown in blue, and the discharge at Wolverine is shown in red. Both glaciers have a lot of discharge all through the July and August seasons when there's a lot of warmth and a lot of melt going on. But you'll notice that it's quite a bit different at Wolverine. There's a lot more runoff and discharge into these September and October periods. Up here in the interior, by the time September or October rolls around, we're, we're down below freezing already, and certainly at Gulcana, it will be quite cold. There's not a lot of melt. But down near the coast, it's warmer. It's still melting, and in fact, they get a lot of rainfall at that time of year. So very different patterns of discharge that really affects what we're going to talk about next with respect to some of these impacts. All that water that gets generated and starts moving down the glacier can carve out these channels and form what are called moulons. And these are these channels that can erode all the way to the bed of the glacier. And when this happens, this runoff will pick up some organic compounds. It'll pick up things like nutrients, like phosphorus. It will get off into the bottom of the glacier where there's a lot of uh, soil or debris and pick up things like micronutrients, which things like iron. Now, it turns out that these micronutrients are really important for some of the species of fish that live near glaciers. If you do any trawling in the front of some of these glaciers in Glacier Bay, right in front of a big tidewater glacier, you're going to pick up a lot of capelin, lanternfish, these kinds of species. And they thrive on a lot of these micronutrients that are coming directly from the glaciers. Of course, these are the kinds of species that feed on the fish, is the seabirds and the marine mammals. So you see we're moving along the food chain, and that it all comes back in some sense to the amount of runoff and the type of runoff and the timing of that runoff from these glacier systems. Now, another thing that we know about this fresh, well, this water that's coming off the ice is that it tends to be fresh. And that means it has a low salt concentration relative to the ocean. So it's coming out into these estuaries, into some salt water, but it's quite a bit lower salinity than the surrounding water. And the other thing we know is that, of course, the water coming off the ice, uh, off the glaciers, is quite cold relative to warmer ocean water. Glacier water, if you've ever hiked through a glacial stream, you'll know this, just around freezing. It's very cold. Now, this has impacts on a lot of different species. This cold water is getting into the lakes and rivers of Alaska, these many lakes that all, all, uh, many of us go to for fishing. And Salmon are, tend, are, are particularly sensitive to things like temperature. The spawning of a salmon uh, will depend largely on the temperature of the stream, and they prefer temperature somewhere around 13 to 18 degrees Celsius. So if you have a lot of fresh water coming in from the glaciers, that can impact the locations and the timing of the salmon spawning runs that are so important throughout Alaska. We step back and take a bit of a, a bigger picture here. We've been talking about runoff from sort of a single glacier into as it makes its way down the valley. Here's the picture if we look at the entire Gulf of Alaska. That's those same glaciers plotted up, but in red are the glaciers that drain south into the Gulf of Alaska. So this is a huge drainage system. This is all the ice that when it, the water melts, it goes south here instead of these other blue ones continue north into the Yukon drainage. 
Now, if we add up all the water that comes from this watershed, it's about the same annual runoff as the Mississippi River. So this is a huge amount of water every year coming from the glaciers and all the rain that occurs in this area. Now, what does all this fresh water runoff do? It has impacts on things like what's called the Alaska Coastal Current. This is an important current that brings water counterclockwise up the coast of Alaska. It brings warm water and nutrients all along the coast, and it has a lot of implications for the fisheries that are in these fjords and inlets of Alaska. So we're concerned about understanding more of how this runoff affects the coastal current. Changes in the discharge of water from glaciers can actually alter the characteristics of that current, which will have implications for things like uh, the fisheries that occur all along our coastlines. It will have impacts on the traditional practices that have been occurring all along these areas for hundreds of years. So this is something that we're studying together with a lot of our various colleagues. All right, we've talked about the mass balance of the glacier. It's tied really closely to climate. Now, if the story ended there, our lives as scientists would be a lot easier. But it turns out that glaciers also flow down the mountainside, because glaciers are like a fluid. They're like if you take a big spoon of molasses and put it on your toast and tilt it, that molasses would slowly start making its way down. It's the same kind of fluid. It's a viscous fluid. It flows a lot slower, but it's the same kind of idea. And so the terrain surrounding a glacier, whether it ends in the ocean or on land, the kind of geology it flows over, these impact how it flows down the landscape. And we know glaciers flow simply by putting a camera and doing some time-lapse photography. Okay, so this is the Yahtzee Glacier down in Icy Bay. These arrows just tell us how fast it's going at different spots, and the, the colors tell us it's faster in the middle than on the edges. This is a picture per day. Some of them were pretty rained over, but you get the idea. This ice is moving down the valley at a really rapid pace, actually. Now, when glaciers come into the water, they also do this. They calve. This is the Yakutat Glacier, which actually ends in a lake. But we get large calving events. That's one way a glacier can lose its mass. It just breaks off into the water. So apart from providing these really uh, beautiful pictures of icebergs, they're important, actually, habitat for a lot of the creatures that live in these areas. These are important um, refuges for things like seals, as shown in this picture. These nearshore animals are dependent on the, the number and the location of these icebergs in places like Glacier Bay. They're also important in terms of hazards, because as many of us might remember, you know, things like the Valley's oil tanker that was probably trying to get around one of these large icebergs that came out of what we're looking at here, which is the Columbia Bay which just generates a lot of icebergs in this area. OK, so we've talked about how the ice starts at high elevations, flows down the valley, generates meltwater. And we've talked about kind of an idealized case where a glacier gains and loses mass from year to year. We haven't really said much about climate and how climate changes. We know climate controls the mass from one year to the next. We've kind of assumed that what we call is a steady climate occurs. In other words, at least in these pictures, the amount that it's gained in one year is equal to the amount it lost the next year. Now, we know in reality this isn't the case. Climate is changing all around the globe. This is from stations globally where red and orange colors are above the century average and blues are below the average. And so as you see, as we go through time over the century, we're going to start seeing more and more reds enter the picture as we get into the last few years. And we see more and more red, especially up at the high polar latitudes. And this is consistent with what all of the global climate models are telling us, which is that climate changes that are expected to occur will be most pronounced, most strong, strongest up at the highest latitudes. This has obvious implications for those of us looking at glaciers that occur at these high latitudes. Now, you might want to say that what I just showed you is really comes from a lot of stations around the world from places, mostly at town sites, where people tend to set up weather stations and climate stations. 
Uh, certainly in Alaska, we measure temperatures at the airports mostly, and most airports are down at pretty low elevations. And so one thing that we're doing in partnership with many agencies is we're getting more measurements up high at high elevations. We want to know, does this represent the high mountain conditions where these glaciers live? And so here's a couple of the stations that we've put in, and we have real-time uh, telemetry uh, transmitting this data back to our lab. We have long records at these two glaciers, Gulcan and Wolverine. So this is right near the glaciers. It's consistent with the other data I showed you, which is the fact that over time, all the way back to our records in the 60s, and the temperature here is on the uh, vertical axis, this is the change in temperature over this period. So we're seeing increases in temperature over areas that uh, include the glaciers. Any time you have a sustained temperature increase like this, you inevitably will cause the glaciers to lose some of their mass over time. So now we're back to our idealized curve again, but we're seeing that not only is there this season-to-season -season variation, but also a longer-term overall drop-off in the mass that's stored in the glacier. Now, any time a glacier has a sustained negative climate like that, in other words, it's warmer than it would be in the past, which is what we're seeing in our climate records, it will thin like this. And it's just like that checkbook example or your wallet. If you start spending more than you had before, your wallet's going to start thinning a little bit. Sustained negative balance, mass balance, leads to thinning, leads to retreat of the glaciers. Now, measuring the thinning and retreat is we, we need some other tools to look at this. And so I'm going to tell you more about some of the modern technologies that we're developing in our lab and in partnership with other groups. One of them here is shown with this aircraft. It's aircraft laser altimetry, and it's using a laser to determine the surface height of the glacier. This is a project that was pioneered by uh, the late Dr. Keith Ecklemeyer. And this is some early footage of, of that system. This is in the back of a, a Piper PA-12. And we're flying up in the St. Elias Mountains. This project's now being led by my colleague, Chris Larson. And they're using a much larger aircraft, a single-engine Otter, using GPS and various other techniques to really get precise. There's the laser altimeter that I talked about. And they're getting from this precise measurements of the height of the glacier over hundreds of miles of glaciers all around the state, shown in these red lines. These kinds of observations give us precise measurements of the surface height change, the thickness change. The red colors in this plot show us areas where the glaciers are thinning. And you can see down at low elevations, this is in Glacier Bay, a lot of thinning in some of these areas. This means the glaciers are not only changing from year to year, but they're losing mass in the long term. And you can see the patterns as we go from 1995 all the way up to 2011. So what are we learning from this aircraft work? If we compare back to maps from the USGS in the 1950s, there's been about a half a meter or about 20 inches of thinning. If you, if you uh, average all the thinning we've measured over every piece of ice in Alaska, we're looking at about that much thinning, half a meter every single year. From the, in the last 20 years or so, we're looking at somewhere more than about half a meter. We're just working on uh, developing our, our newer estimates. We'll have some new numbers here in the next couple of months. We're definitely seeing an acceleration of thinning in these glaciers. Now, one more, uh, even, uh, we're taking a step even uh, back further into space now by using satellite technology to look at the retreat of the glaciers. And this is simply taking pictures of the glaciers to figure out where they are and then mapping that over time. And you get maps like this. In the yellow are areas where the glaciers have retreated over the last 50 years. In red, the areas where they've advanced a little bit. This is in Glacier Bay. And so this is part of this mapping that we've done. What we're learning from these kinds of area change observations, this is just looking at the national parks, which has funded a lot of this work. Nearly all the glaciers we've looked at in the parks have been retreating over the past 50 to 60 years. There's been about an 8% reduction in the area of glaciers. Now, that might not seem like a lot, but it's actually quite significant given the large mass of ice that, masses that we have up here in Alaska. What is the implications of this retreat? What it does is, many of you who've been to the Exit Glacier may have seen you walk along the different years where the glacier was at this location. 
it's creating an area where we can have new species, new habitat forming because this soil that's left over is very nutrient rich. And so we have plants growing. Things like the Kitslitz murrelet here is dependent heavily on the location of the tidewater glaciers. They actually use them for nesting. As these glaciers come back, this is impacting the, the habitat of these birds. And even things like tourism and recreation are impacted. If these glaciers are retreating so rapidly that they're changing the landscape in a way that uh, tourists may not be uh, used to, uh, different from what they had seen before. It's important to talk as well about impacts to things like infrastructure. We're doing a study out here at the Valdez Glacier. This is one of the most rapidly thinning and retreating glaciers in the entire Chugach Mountains. There used to be a lake, or sorry, there used to be a glacier right at the end of that lake just about 50 years ago. And now there's a huge lake in front of it. And one thing we're trying to investigate is if this glacier continues to thin rapidly, that water might start to flood into these other areas. And they've gone and built an airport and a uh, trash dump and uh, infrastructure all around that area that might be impacted by uh, future flooding events. We should talk a little bit about hydropower. We all hear a lot about this in the news. If glaciers exist within the watershed where the water is going to be delivered to these dams, we need to know what the glaciers are doing now and into the future. This is part of the resource that will drive the amount of energy that's available in these dams. This is the Sasitna Dam Project. And there's a small percentage of glacier ice in here, but you don't need a lot of glaciers to alter the runoff regime or the runoff volumes that end up at the dam. And so there's a study underway to learn what might happen to these glaciers 50 years down the line. Will it generate more or less water for these kinds of places, resources? I'm going to finish <coughs> off today by talking about one of my most favorite satellite systems. This is called the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, and it's a really unique set of satellites that were launched about 10 years ago. It's actually two satellites, and their orbital variations are mapped through time in order to allow us to look at the gravity field of the Earth in extremely high detail. What we're looking at in this globe here is actually a picture of the Earth's gravity. In areas of red is where there's more mass, and areas of blue, less mass. We can look at the monthly variations in the Earth's gravity with this data, and we get a very big, broad picture of what's happening to the glaciers. This is remarkable data. What this shows us on the right, the colors where the gravity field is being affected. In other words, the mass is going away enough that the gravity field is showing up in the gravity data. <clears throat> We're seeing mass losses in areas that we already knew and suspected from other data sets, like Greenland and Antarctica, Areas where we already are aware of massive losses of ice, Patagonia, and here we are in Alaska. These reds and yellows indicate losses of mass from these systems by changing the actual gravity of the Earth. We then get one of these mass balance curves for the entire region of Alaska. It tells us the overall trend of how much mass is being lost over this 10-year period. So what are we learning from all of those data sets together? Alaska glaciers actually add about 65 gigatons of water to the oceans every year. Now that is about 0.18 millimeters per year of sea level. At present, sea level is going up about two and a half millimeters. So a millimeter is about the size of a dime. So about two or three millimeters is how much global sea level is increasing right now. So we're 0.18 of that. That doesn't seem like a lot, but it's actually quite significant. If you go out to some of these coastal areas where a lot of people live, these very shallow shorelines, you don't need a lot of sea level change to have that water come a long ways inland and affect a lot of people. Alaska is contributing 7% to the global rate of sea level rise, which is remarkable because Alaska has a tiny fraction of the amount of total ice on the planet right now. <clears throat> there are impacts of this that many of you have heard about. Shorelines will be eroded. This is a picture of the coast of California. The actual currents that generate that, that transport heat around the globe, <clears throat> these so-called thermal haline currents, they bring water, their ocean currents to transport Earth's heat, can be altered by this fresh water that's being deposited into the ocean. And finally, the regions where many native villages here, bringing back to a local example, this is a picture of 
184 native villages in Alaska that a recent study showed that are prone to flooding or erosion events because of where they're located, either on the coast or near these rivers. So that's 86% of these villages in Alaska are potentially impacted by this. And now this is a complicated picture. It's related to many different factors, but the glaciers and their mass losses are tied into this because flooding events can generate these kinds of problems with these villages. <clears throat> I'm going to finish today by talking about what the future may hold. We're just starting to develop models that allow us to project out into the future what might happen. This is a plot of the expected changes of Alaska glacier volume all the way out to 2100. And some of my colleagues have been working on this over the last number of years. Each of these lines is a different global climate simulation. There are many of these around the world where scientists put together estimates of the temperature into the future. So this is from a different model for each of these lines, but all of them consistently say temperatures will increase and cause the glacier volume to go more negative. So glaciers will lose mass. To our best estimate right now, we're looking at around a 32% or 32 decrease in the volume of glaciers in Alaska by the time 2100 rolls around. There's a lot of variability in these estimates still. Our models need to be developed more. But you can see the range of numbers, 18 to 45 percent, that we're working with right now. There's very little doubt that the Alaska glaciers will lose volume into the future. And now think about how that's going to affect all the things we talked about today. If we have more water getting into these streams and rivers, more water affecting the estuaries, what kinds of impacts will that have on the people living nearby, on the salmon, on the different species living there? We're just beginning to piece these stories together and to understand what kind of impacts may occur. OK, so we've talked about the mass balance and dynamics of a glacier and their complex interactions how this delivers water to ecosystems, affecting fresh water and nutrient availability. That has impacts on subsistence, living, recreation, aesthetics, has economic impacts, tourism, hydropower, and finally, these global impacts going all the way out into the ocean with effects on people living very far away from us, in fact. So hopefully you get a picture of how interrelated all of these factors are and all the things that we're just starting to learn about these systems. And what I'd like to do to just finish today is tell you a little bit about our group. We have a, a large uh, group of faculty, emeritus faculty. A lot of what I showed you today comes from efforts of all of us working together on these problems. We have a large group of graduate students, postdoctoral students and staff, all of us working on these problems. And I'd like to dedicate the talk today to my former PhD advisor, Keith Eckelmeyer, who, um, who's not with us today and probably taught me most of what I, I talked to you about in this lecture. So thanks, Keith. And I will finish just by listing all the funding agencies. Many different uh, federal, local agencies are supporting this work. And I have a lot of different collaborators all around the world as well. So I really appreciate your attention. I think we're going to take a short pause and then open it up to some questions. So thanks, thanks very much.